May I now invite the other three honourable guests to the stage for the panel discussion. Professor Frederick Ma, Honorary Professor of School of Economics and Finance, the University of Hong Kong, and former Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury of the HKSAL Government. <laughs> Mr. Anthony Lern, Group CEO of Network Group and former Financial Secretary for the HKSAL Government. And Ms. Wendy Yoon, Head of Commercial Banking, Rather than Sales Management, Tencent Bank Limited. I'm going to be your moderator for today's forum. First of all, thank you very much, Joe, for a very, very comprehensive uh, presentation on the uh, financial services human capital. I think the report is extremely well done. Thank you very much for that. And uh, other than Joe, we have uh, Ms. Wendy Yun. Uh, Wendy is the head of a uh, very long title. Uh, anyway, she's the head of wealth management sales, whatever, for Hang Seng Bank. Very senior person. Uh, on my left is my old friend, Anthony Leung. Uh, I need to spend a little bit more time introducing Anthony, because first of all, he's the past. As you can see from the title of this forum, it's past, present, and the future. He is the past. Uh, Wendy is the present, and you are the future. Um, first of all, Anthony and I met in university back in 1970. So we have been friends for 45 years. It's a long time. And uh, after we graduated in 1973, both of us pursued a banking career. He joined the Citibank. In those days, it wasn't called Citibank. It was called First National Citibank for those of you who are very young and you don't know about the history. I joined the so-called Chase Manhattan Bank, which doesn't exist anymore. It's called J.P. Morgan Chase. Anyway, the interesting thing about Wendy and Anthony, let me give you a bit of background. Wendy actually graduated with a degree in biochemistry, not in accounting, not in finance. So for those of you, who are not finance major and want to pursue a career in financial services, don't give up. Okay. Um, for Anthony, well, he studied economics like me. <laughs> so called, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> At uh, Hong Kong University. So the interesting thing about Anthony is that although he had been with Citibank for a long time before he switched shop to Chase and became my colleague. He actually uh, had covered many areas of banking at Citibank, including corporate banking. I think you started as a management trainee, then into treasury, and then into private bank, investment bank, and he was later you know, involved in management of the bank as the chairman of Chase, uh, oh, J.P. Morgan Chase, sorry, J.P. Morgan Chase. Then, then he left the bank to join the SAR government as financial secretary, as you know. So he left the banking industry for a short two years time. Then he joined the Blackstone, the private equity group, which is again, you know, asset management. So his involvement in the financial services industry is very long probably around, over, definitely almost 40 years, excluding the two year um, short period in the government. This is the first question I'm going to ask Anthony. Joe has painted a very, very, uh, shall I say, a very rosy picture for career in financial services. Here, we're looking at a past banker who some two years ago left the financial services industry, and switch into property. He is now the CEO of Landform Group. Okay, so why are you abandoning the uh, financial services ship, Anthony? 
You are not uh, optimistic about career in financial services anymore? Well, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, but I would like to also uh, pay my condolences to Dr. Rachel Huang. Uh, uh, Dr. Huang was our vice chancellor when Fred and I was in the, were in the university. So uh, to a certain extent, I think they're holding this uh, symposium here uh, in a way is a good tribute to our own to our vice chancellor. Uh, may he rest in peace. Now, certainly, Fred, you know, I am the past as far as financial services uh, is concerned, but on the other hand, it may not be exactly right because I am still a director of a mainland Chinese bank. Uh, right now. <laughs> so I'm not abandoning it uh, completely. While I can say that I am the past, but that is more because. Um, my current job requires me to travel much less and so for family and personal reason I left the industry but as I said I'm not completely uh, away from the financial services industry but as Joe has uh, kind of presented earlier there is still a lot of future in financial services and let me just kind of lay out a few reasons first of all for every transaction that you do whether you're buying certain things or investing there is a flip side, there is a financial transaction. So as the world grows and as the economic activities in the world increases, there will be growth in financial services. It's just a matter of whether the financial services is provided by a bank or by a loan bank through, say, uh, the mobile phone. So, so generically, the industry will not die. It just transforms. Secondly, Hong Kong being uh, where we are, meaning we are the bridge between the global world and China. And with China growing, and especially right now China is at the phase where they're exporting capital. And there are many other initiatives, including the One Belt, One Road, as well as the Running B Going International. Hong Kong is well equipped as a financial center to serve China by providing financial services. So there is no reason to doubt that the sector in Hong Kong will actually become the past. If anything, this financial services sector will be a shining sector in Hong Kong, and that's one that I'm extremely optimistic about. So, so, so I think, the, I think the Fred is trying to somehow stimulate the discussion by saying that it may be the past. But it's just that I am the past, but not you. But having said that, um, if I may kind of just uh, take the opportunity to just comment on uh, Joe's presentation. What shocked me was the inadequate language skill that the employers are complaining about. And that is something that I hope uh, our students in Hong Kong will take note of. Because after all, what we employ you know, as a past employee in financial services, and as Fred said, I've been in banking, I've been a trader, I actually have overseen, uh, I also a securities firm I was in the investment management business, I was in private equity. I actually had served as a director of an insurance company as well, EIA. So I have covered basically all sectors of financial services. What we are looking for from graduates is what we call trainability. Meaning you have the ability to be trained. As uh, Joe said, we don't expect you to really understand the uh, technical aspects of banking or insurance or securities. But we do hope that you can be trained. So language skill is very important. The ability to learn is very important. That's why in the education reform that I was involved, say, 15 years ago, we, 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 we focused so much on community, communication skill and also the ability to learn. And I don't want to take the, the, entire, the time, so back, back to you. I will come back on the uh, English proficiency and Mandarin proficiency a topic later, but let me uh, ask the present banker. Uh, as a, a senior uh, management member at the Hang Seng Bank, when you hire uh, graduates or managerial level uh, staff, what are you looking for? And uh, do you agree with Joe's report that uh, language and communication skills are very important? 
Uh, first of all, thank you, Fred, for the questions. And well, when we talk about uh, recruitment, I do do a lot of recruitment uh, almost several times every month. And um, what calibre that uh, we are looking for, I totally agree with Anthony that trainability is really, really important because we don't expect the people that jump into the job, we know exactly what they are going to do or do whatever that we need them to do. But um, because every bank or different situation will have different requirements. But apart from the trainability, what I would say is, um, first of all, is the interest. You need to show us whether you have interest in the post that you are applying. Most of the time when we do interview and then we, we find something very interesting is that um, the candidate does not really know what the job um, is about. And so it, it do is a bit disappointed from the employer's perspective that, well, it shows me that you have no interest at all in the job because we believe if you have interest, you will have the energy to move on. And the second caliber is about the drive. Because, uh, you know, financial industry is very exciting and very challenging. It changed from time to time and under a faster and faster pace. So whether you have drive to move on and, and to accept the new things is really, really important. And finally, what I would say is, that, and also from my perspective, I think is most important is the communication skills. When we talk about communication skills, it's not just talk. It's not just means that you're talking to people. Of course, talking to people in a very articulated way is very important. But at the same time, and then in the day-to-day -day business world, we need to negotiate and we need to liaise the things with the other people, other teams, or even within your teams every day. How you use your words or how you use your resources to influence the others is really important. Um, maybe, I, I'm not sure, maybe because of the, our daily lives right now, we, because of the technology, we do a lot of um, messaging. We use a lot of WhatsApp, WeChat, and that kind of platform. But in the business world, meeting, face-to-face -face meeting is really important. When you make a most important decision, you need to, you want to meet with the people first. So how you talk and then how you influence the others in the meeting is very important. And uh, we did see some gaps right now when we do some, when we take intake some new graduates or the new joiners to the industry. Joe, you said that you actually spoke to some 90 companies. Can you give us an idea what uh, this 90 companies are from? And, I mean, from the respective countries? And, sure. You know, so it is, it's really across you know, many spectrums in Hong Kong, across you know, banks and insurance companies and all that. Uh, but I, I'll come back a little bit to the point around, you know, in, in my perspective, I think two of the worst influence in terms of a career in financial, you know, and professional services, one's called WhatsApp, the other one's called Facebook. I'll tell you why. The problem with WhatsApp is that you get so used to typing in a very casual way, and it's so easy to bring that into work, okay? So I cannot tell you how many you know, emails and stuff that I've seen with incorrect spelling, with um, very casual uh, language, with very um, uh, sort of incomplete wording and things that I need to kind of guess at what the, you know, the author is trying to say. And I would say that, okay, it's, it's a great tool to, um, to communicate among friends, I think, right? But I think in terms of, you know, as a way to, in general, you know, figure out how to communicate, I think, you know, the WhatsApp, um, influence. I think it's a bad one. I'll tell you the, the, the Facebook, I think it's worse. Okay, Facebook is really, I think, the number one killer, right? So I'll tell you two stories. The first story is around why Facebook is bad. So the first thing is that, you know, many, many years ago when, when we were working, not as old as when you guys were working, but still, you know, you go on a top assignment, right? You get yelled at by the client or by your boss, right? You get really angry, you go home. What do you do? You can maybe call your parents. Right, and say, oh, you know, this really bad boss, what happened, you know, all that kind of stuff. What would they say? They would say, well, you're still young, boss are like that, deal with it, go back, to, go back to work tomorrow, okay? Today what happens? You go back, Facebook, okay? This ridiculous boss, all these things. Within five minutes, all your friends, what would they say? Just quit, join me, I'm on some trip elsewhere out there, you know, enjoy life, it's not worth it, right? And, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it is very uncool on Facebook to say, deal with it, right? Suck it up. This is part of life, right? The cool thing on Facebook is, come join me. It's not worth it. It is a terrible, right? I really sympathize with you. That's what I did to my boss, right? Just 
send you some story and some link of someone who yelled back at the boss, right? So, and, and then the, the worst part is, you know, I'm actually their friend. So I see this entire thing happening, okay? And they obviously don't know that. And next day, next thing I know is that there's a presentation letter, right? And then they go off and do something else. And, and it is, in some ways, a joke, but it's actually not a joke, right? I mean, I really think that today, there's great things going on in communication. There's great things going on in technology. However, I think that how do that, um, you know, translate into how, what we need to do ourselves, right, from a professional perspective, right, from a confidentiality perspective, from a character building perspective, I think that's not clear. And I think that we haven't still quite figured out how to separate the personal from the professional, from the dealing with adversity, from the dealing with, you know, other, you know, challenges. And I think that that's actually where I find it to be tricky, but something that we all have to face as a community. So are you saying, Joe, that uh, students today are not very hungry? Students today are not very persevere, and uh, they uh, opt for easy way out? Well, I'm keen to understand what you guys have to say about it. In, in, in my perspective, I found you know, students today in many ways right, to be actually very creative and very innovative in what they want to do. Okay, so I have found students, if they're interested in something, that you know, the, the resilience to find stuff over the internet, to really get very deep into something. Because today I think that there's a lot more information at hand for people to do something, right? So to do a project today, right, once upon a time, after 10 o'clock, there's nothing you can do. There's no library to go to. There's no information you can gather. Today, you can do 24 seven on something. So I found students in some ways today to be going for something and then going for it for weeks and be very, very good at it. However, there's a little bit of a downside to it. So if you're not very interested, there are too many distractions around, right? So I don't know whether I can say that they're not as you know, perseverance or resilience, I would just say that, you know, the interest level kind of overrides everything. So if I'm not interested, then I find that the level of perseverance to be very low. If I'm very interested, I've found the ambition and the ability to be very resourceful to extremely high, much higher than when I was growing up and certainly when you were growing up. Do you agree with what he said? <laughs> well, I think, well, I'm not quite a user of Facebook. <laughs> Because I am, you are the past. No, that's one. Uh, clearly, <laughs> well, no doubt about it. Uh, no doubt about it. But on the other hand, uh, I am actually on Facebook, but I don't use it for fear that uh, there will be too many so-called secrets being leaked out. So in I'm politics, here. you need Facebook, though. True, but I'm not <laughs> in <laughs> politics. Thank oh, you. <laughs> not yet, anyway. <laughs> but uh, but I think it it, it brings forth a. Uh, a, a general issue, and that is how you select your career, or what, what would you do? Uh, clearly, I think most employers right now still employ based on your academic results and that uh, add up uh, kind of with an interview. But actually, more and more researchers uh, find out that the interview is actually not a very predictive way in selecting staff. So a lot more employers are using tests, including psychological tests, including competency tests, so on and so forth. Really, in order to be successful, or in order to be successful in selecting the right uh, employee, and for, the, uh, and for you to select the right uh, career, you need to find uh, a job, and we need to find a candidate that really is in the uh, kind of middle section of uh, say free circles, meaning the, where free circles would um, somehow come together. One is your personality. A lot of people don't really understand your own personality. Some are ex much more extrovert, some are much more introvert. And say even in financial services, if you want to be, uh, uh, if you want to be a so-called relationship manager, uh, you need to you need to have a personality that is actually fairly outgoing. So for the more kind of introvert people, that may not suit you. So that's the first one. Secondly is really your competency, what you're good at. Um, and then thirdly is really your interest, whether you're interested in that thing. So it has to be a match of all three. Many a times students would apply a certain job because either the pay is high or because your parents said it is good or your friends said it is actually a very good job. And many times when they uh, go into the job, they find that it actually would not match either of these three. So, so as Joe said, if we find people that are interested in the job, they have the personality and they're competent, they're extremely good. 
and they will spend hours or even days working on the topic tirelessly. But if they're not interested, they'll quit because life is easy. Um, and if they can't really find a job uh, immediately, the parents should support them anyway. And besides, there are so many friends uh, cheering them on. So I think really is for you to find the right job and for employers to find the right employee, we really have to find out whether you have qualities in all three areas. And that's why many employers are using personality tests and competency tests to select their employees in addition to interviews. Well, uh, of course, I totally agree because um, as I employ, and then usually um, the first questions or the first area that I would like to find out is about whether the candidate will have interest in their job. So interest is, I, I think, is the, is the key because it's a it's source of energy for you to move on. But one supplement I want to add is, uh, well, um, I, I work in my bank for 19 years. Someone said that um, you, you're really weird. Why, why you don't change your job? Because you, you, are, you cannot or you are, you are, you're afraid. But what I want to say is that um, when you're doing your job, and then usually you will face some challenges, but give more patience. I'm not talking about, I'm not blaming about technology, but actually because technology brings the world faster, much faster than before. The information flow is much higher in a, in a faster speed, and everybody gets less uh, patience or impatience. But sometimes when you face a challenge or when you face a problem, you invest a little bit more time. And then to me right now, and then once I spend 19 years in one company, what I get right now, the, the most treasured thing for me, and then to help me do my work is my network. Network, when you want to build your network in your career, you need time. You need time to know your people and to build the trust. Right now, once you have the trust, and then you can pick up a phone call, and then you can get information that you want in a very easy way, or in a very efficient or effective way, which helps you do your work in a, in a much more efficient or effective way, I would say. And so, and then what I want to give you one comment is that give a little bit more patience in your career and then with your boss <laughs> and also with your colleagues. But uh, if I may add, it uh, sounds more like a career uh, counseling session than developing a financial career. But I think this is something that as an, a, as an employer, particularly an employer in financial services, uh, I would like to add and that is besides your kind of skills, you, you, you need to be very good in what you do and also pay attention to kind of, uh, uh, kind of your quality of your work. In Hong Kong, you, I don't know what the marking system is like, I mean, I say in, in primary schools and in secondary schools, the passing mark is 60 out of 100. So if you are 61, just like my daughter, uh, you pass. And she will not waste more energy because there's a very efficient way in allocating her energy, to, so just pass is good. And, but on the other hand, uh, say, even for, um, say, her school, if you achieve 90 or above, you get an A. So you get an A, you, are, you, you feel quite good, or, quite good already. But in work, it won't work. Because like in Blackstone, and by the way, Blackstone is probably one of the best employers in the world. Uh, they pay even higher than the investment banks. Um, Do you mind telling us how much should they pay? <laughs> okay, round number, because uh, Blackstone employs people uh, based on just one scale, and that's the New York scale. So for an analyst, for a first graduate, they usually would pay, say, over a million in Hong Kong. Um, so, so they have choices. But if we ask, say, um, a, uh, an analyst, which is the, kind of the entry job, to do a spreadsheet uh, to write something. Blackstone hires you not to just um, let you do something that has 60% accuracy or even 90% accuracy. Because if you do your spreadsheet wrong, we will not care to check it or double check it. We rely on your, an on your analysis and make investment decisions. And if you're wrong, we'll be losing lots of money. So. Um, employers like Blackstone would require 100% accuracy. And if, you took, and if you make mistakes too often, then you're gone. Likewise, we do not hire people and let you write English or Chinese with a lot of mistakes, and we have to spend time correcting it. So, hence the message. If you want to have a job with a good employer, be it financial services or whatever, make sure that you 
do your work well in basic things like language, in basic things like uh, mathematics or doing spreadsheets, we do not expect you to be wrong. We expect 100% accuracy. I want to ask the question on the English proficiency. Um, in case you are not aware, Anthony was actually our Education Commission chairman. He was also the chairman of our so-called UGC, University Grants Committee. And uh, Anthony, can you share with us why employers in Joe's report comment about our English efficiency? Uh, is it has to do with our medium of instruction in mother language, which you initiate? Well, first of all, I did not propose the mother tongue so-called as medium of instruction. I mean, obviously, a lot of people got it wrong, said that Anthony, you were the mother tongue. Mo yu They introduced uh, mother tongue as the medium of, of instruction. Uh, I was, at that point of time, a member of the executive council. It was actually um, the then director of education uh, that proposed it to the first executive council of the HKSAL. Now, obviously, later on, it got passed in the executive council. So based on the policy of collective responsibility, I did not really come out and oppose. But before it was approved, uh, I think there are records that show that I had a fairly rigorous discussion disagreeing with that approach. Because it's not so much whether it should be in English or Chinese, obviously that's important, but whether it should be all English or all Chinese. Why not differentiate according to the ability of the student as well as the ability of the teachers? Also, for Chinese, at that point of time, I did propose, and obviously there is a current debate going on in Hong Kong, that Chinese language should be taught by Putonghua. I mean, obviously there is also a science that shows that they would like our students to, to be better in Mandarin, but I would say it's probably better in Chinese overall. Because a lot of research have shown clearly that if you teach Chinese in Putonghua, your Chinese skill would be, writing skill uh, particularly, would be a lot better obviously as well as your Putonghua skill. But for English uh, as a medium of, of instruction, that is very important. But it doesn't mean that if you are, if, if you're being taught in Chinese, your English should be bad. A lot of this really has to do with reading. Reading from the very young age is extremely important. Obviously, uh, I would like our kids to read in both English and Chinese. But it doesn't really matter. As long as you're interested in reading and if you're good in one language, chances are later on in life, you can be good in both. But too many of our students do not read. Now, I also come to the defense of the Hong Kong system. If you look at our top students in Hong Kong, I will argue that their language skill, English and Chinese, are probably as good if not better than our students in our days. It's just that nowadays we require each and every student to be good in both, because the demand for students that are good in both English and Chinese is a lot more than our days. During our days, if you're not good, chances are you will not get into secondary schools anyway. You go to work in the factory. And if you cannot pass your kind of exam in Form 3, you got kicked out. And only 1.3% of the age cohort during our days could enter university. And nowadays, if you add up all the sub-degrees and all, it's actually 80% of the age cohort. So the requirement is different, and also the so-called comparison, or the comparators, are probably not fair. If we compare today's top 1.3% of the age cohort, I would argue that their language skill, their creativity, and everything else is better than us. Pass. That was the past. <laughs> and that's why we are the past. <laughs> well, I... I just want to ask um, another question. If you were given a choice, uh, this also uh, could be answered by you, Joe, because you did the survey, you did the report. If you were given the opportunity to uh, enter the financial services industry again as the future, like some of the students who are sitting here, and assuming, okay, one group is rather outgoing, and the other group is rather uh, not so outgoing, shall I say, okay? What job would you take, Wendy, in a bank? 
Well, um, well, depends on your personality. If you are outgoing, I think um, you naturally you like to deal with people, front office relationship managers, and that the one jobs or those jobs that you day to day you serve your clients and maybe a suitable job for you because actually you're outgoing, you like to talk with the others. But uh, on the other hand, I think financial services is very interesting because uh, the diversity is there. And then we have so many jobs. If you are not so outgoing, but your analytical skills are so good, and then there are lots of middle office analytical jobs and even back office jobs for you, and then you can also excel to the top levels. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would say that you know these days, you know, as I would one of the things that really came to you know, um, is that, you know, it is very true that front office jobs is getting very challenging, okay? Because if you, if you are, you know, a um, relationship manager of a large, you know, home company, it's very likely that you will be required to actually understand a lot more around cross-border trade, right? It's, uh, it's getting a lot more globalized, right? There's a lot of things that's going on overseas you understand, right? If you are to serve, you know, Chinese companies, I think that you need to serve mainland clients, right, in a very, in a very big way, Right? And you know, part of this is also understanding both you know, the, the culture as well as communication skills. Right? Yeah. So I would say that in all front office jobs, in the, if I may say so, right, at the top of the industry, I think it's getting very challenging. And I think that that's actually where, if you, your aspiration is around doing that, right, I think that that is an extremely challenging job. And that's actually something where you know, I would say that um, it's great for someone who is outgoing and to learn the rest of the world. These days though, I would say that let's not forget that the mid and back office a very well-paying and very secure job. As a risk management officer in the bank, you're the last person to get fired because yeah. you know you're doing risk management. How can you fire risk managers, right? Total, you can fire totally sales agree. staff. Totally right? agree. <laughs> you know, and don't forget that if you're head of operations, it's a very good job. Head of operations these days are talking about lean management, talking about no wastage. No operations is a science. And we were doing the surveys. Some people said that, well, if I want to go into a operations job in a, in a securities firm or a bank, why did I go through all this studying so that I can do operations? It's no longer true. Operations is a science. Operations is a profession. Right? People at the top of operations actually think about operations in a very different way than doing photocopying, faxing, and doing you know kind of back office job back there. Right? So I think the world is going towards an area where Every single discipline is getting very professionalized, right? And for us, the most important thing is to find something in there that kind of, you know, you can excel at it, right? And you're actually quite good at it, right? And I, you know, and I would say that operations, risk management, mid office, I mean, there are plenty of, I mean, and I would say from a risk reward perspective, I think it's well worth your time to investigate whether mid office is the place you want to be. Because front office, I tell you, when the wave comes, you know, you're the first one to get laid off, right? Unfortunately. Yeah, uh, one add-on, and then you know, and then give you a piece of information. You know the hottest job, and then we see the big trend within the banking industry these days: uh, compliance, um, risk management, financial crime, anti-money laundering. I'm not sure whether the students know about that, but all the people within the bank, and then we all know about that because we are being regulated by a lot of these kinds of supporting functions. And so sometimes, at some point of time, we front office people, I'm also front office, want to be that want to be in that position as well, because I want to regulate the others, rather than being uh, regulated. Uh, Anthony, if you were in your 20s, 30s, what job would you like? Well, I think, uh, again, it depends on your personality. Uh, I actually started off in banking, uh, in the lending department, but I did that only for about a year, and then I was a trader. Um, and I find that I love it. Uh, so. So I think the first thing really is you have to know your personality and what you like and also whether you have the competency to do, to do certain things. Um, and by the way, I mean, uh, financial services, as I said, it will transform, it will never die. And after spending a few years in certain things, uh, there may be a chance that you would kind of set up your own financial technology company and write an app and then all of a sudden you may become a billionaire. So, so, so financial services, can lead to many things. Obviously, everybody envies um, kind of uh, Alibaba and uh, and uh, Tencent, but I'm sure you may. Well, I'm not sure. You may or may not know that uh, while you know Jack Ma and Tony Ma, but.
but there are number two, the COOs are actually all coming from financial services. Why? Because people that have worked in financial services have the background and the skills and the knowledge that can enable these firms to succeed. Plus the fact that both of them actually work in Hong Kong. Hong Kong people has a quality that is actually very much um, treasured by our mainland entrepreneurs, and that is our kind of deep-rooted sense of the rule of law, of compliance. And that is particularly important if these companies are going global. So, so don't look at financial services as one that is a in-all, be-all, but look at it as something that you can learn. You have a great foundation to work on that can lead to all kinds of careers later on in your life. I uh, want to ask Joe this question. Um, in your report, you talk about uh, the need to train our students in private banking, kind of one-stop uh, shop. Why don't you suggest in your report to adopt the Singapore model of having an Institute of Wealth Management? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, you, um, there are actually quite a number of institutions in Hong Kong that actually provide professional um, continuing education right, in the industry. But I would say that, again, if I look across all the institutions, one of the biggest opportunities for us in Hong Kong is to be a leader in Asia around financial education. Right? I actually do think that financial services education, there is a huge potential right, around how Hong Kong can be the center of that professional education. Right? If you think about all the top bankers in Hong Kong, all the top you know, risk guys in Hong Kong, all the top you know, compliance guys in Hong Kong, you know, I think that there is actually, Hong Kong has by far a much deeper bench of people who are veterans, who have seen the world, who have seen across Asia, if you ask the question of, are you more likely to find someone in Hong Kong who understands across Asia the different regimes of different banking, is you more likely to find that person in Hong Kong or anywhere else in Asia? I would say no one would question Hong Kong's position as being very dominant in finding the, the professionals. Now, however, the question is that if you have this wealth of resources in Hong Kong, what's the opportunity? The opportunity is to set up, not set up, but maybe you know, find a way how to figure out all these resources can be can be channeled right, into a way that can help a professional education in Hong Kong becoming the leading, leading edge, where everyone else around Asia and the rest of the world would come to Hong Kong to get that you know, accreditation, right? and then to go back or stay in Hong Kong. And that would be fabulous. I think a lot of different organizations in Hong Kong are doing it, but at the same time, are they doing it at a level that is world-class, that is truly leading edge, and that's attracting all the talent coming over? I'm not sure. Right? And I think that is a, it's an opportunity, but it's a very good question. Well, the reason why I asked about the private banking question is, in case you don't know, both Anthony and I were, uh, <clears throat> at one point or another, uh, ran the private bank for uh, Citibank and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. That's why the question. Because I think private banking is a very, very uh, uh, you know, good area for students to join. Anyway, um, a question for all of you, but specifically for Anthony. If you were the chief executive of Hong Kong SAR, <laughs> uh, how would you deal with Joe's uh, point on the fact that uh, senior managers want to have better housing, uh, more clean air, and more international schools for them to come to Hong Kong. But when I was uh, working for CH, I was already CH Tong, of course. <laughs> I was already proposing. I thought that. you talked about Ji Hong. Oh, I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Both are very good CH. But uh, I, w I was already proposing that uh, we should set up more international schools in Hong Kong. Uh, because in order to attract overseas talents, and Hong Kong should be a hub for talents worldwide, we have to take care of the education of their kids. Because after all, as we all know, you know for senior executives, uh, our bosses are not really the partners in the firm, but I mean, uh, the partner at home. And if she or 
he complains about the kids' education, then chances are we'll say no uh, to going to this place. And unfortunately, we have not been kind of keeping up with the demand uh, of providing enough international schools in Hong Kong. As far as air is concerned, obviously, we should be doing more. And hence, at that point of time, we introduced measures, as you know, to introduce the ultra-low sulfur um, diesel in Hong Kong. And I think we can do more in that area, too. Um, and as far as housing, for senior executive, that isn't really a concern. Because, I mean, uh, when I was kind of still in the financial services, I hired somebody from New York, and the monthly budget that we provided for that person, monthly budget for renting a house was over half a million dollars. So, I mean, uh, as, as, as long as the firms can make money, I mean, uh, housing is not as much of an issue. However, I would say that housing is a big issue for everybody. Because unless you have decent accommodation, how can you have the peace of mind to work properly? And hence, I support the government's initiative in finding land to provide for more housing, particularly public housing, because if you look at private housing, it's way too expensive. I'm speaking as a developer, it's way too expensive. So, so I would hope that uh, the government can effectively find the land to provide housing in Hong Kong. But don't worry about the senior executive, they can pay. <laughs> Wendy. Uh, in your present position, do you think that these uh, three things, as mentioned in Joe's report, are impediment to senior management recruitment? Uh, yes, I totally agree. Uh, I think it's not just to senior management, even the middle management, with, if they are the expatriates and when they come to Hong Kong, I think this, if they have family, these are the three major areas that they would think about. And uh, from a, well, of course, Anthony, uh, um, a very good or seasoned banker or, and also work in the government. He knows a lot more about policies. And then for me as a banker, and then I would say uh, we totally support the international schools in Hong Kong. And then when there is international school, do come to us. <laughs> yeah, and then I think one of the things that you know, I think is, is quite important is I think you know, it's really, you know, today Hong Kong actually, you know, and, and I, I made this comment a lot, is I think it's actually a lot more attractive for people outside Hong Kong than people in Hong Kong, right? When I ask a lot of my colleagues who have moved to Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a very user-friendly place, actually, right? You think about um, whether it's living here, whether it's actually, you know, the, all, all the services here, right? I think that, you know, in many ways, Hong Kong, despite of not doing a whole lot on a lot of places, right, I think that Hong Kong actually has remained a very good place to actually live in, right? And that's why I think that our ability to attract people to come to Hong Kong is still something that we are, you know, we have an advantage, right? The question is really, you know, do we, you know, are we welcoming that? I think the question, you know, in some ways as we were doing our, our research is that while we see that, right, one of the overriding questions is that do we think that in the financial services that our opportunities for local people, right, is getting subsumed by people who are coming in from the outside, right? So as, as we think about this, one of the biggest worries is that, you know, is that providing too much competition for us internally here so that we're not getting opportunities? So therefore, on Anthony's, you know, kind of international school point, the question on the local sentiment is going to be, why don't they own the schools? Because that's only benefiting that crowd coming in from outside, taking over our jobs, right? And I think that that, for a lot of expats, is going to be their question, is are we going to remain a welcoming place, right, for international bankers to come to Hong Kong to live in? Yes, you know, air can be cleaner, yes, schools can be better, but overriding that, there's also a other sentiment is that, you know, for Hong Kong to be an international financial center, right, we need to continue to look outwards, right? If we decide to look inwards, if we decide to close off the borders, if we decide to have, you know, more locals in here as a, as a ratio, must be 80% locals and 20% expats, right? If we impose these things, I think it, it would be much harder for us to become an international financial center. However, the sentiment within Hong Kong today, I think that there is some sentiment around how do we enable our local students, local people to have the opportunity. And I think that, that is a debate that we continue to need to have because without having some resolution around that, I think the sentiment in Hong Kong is going a little bit on, on one way. And I think that whether the experts will feel like, well, am I, is it the right opportunity to come to Hong Kong today, despite all the benefits I see, there's a little bit around the emotional mindset as well as these physical, right, the schools, the living conditions, right, the air, which I think can all be overcome with more schools, but I think the overriding sentiment on top of it 
around, am I really welcome? Is it a place I want to come? Is something that we need to also come to terms with as a society? Yeah, I think uh, I would like to echo what uh, Joe has said. I talked to a lot of people, uh, including foreigners, and uh, right now our firm is uh, engaging a kind of brand uh, building firm to assess how we can improve the brand of a certain project that we have. And most of them are from outside Australians, Americans, and French, particularly the Europeans. They are telling me that, look, he said, you know, I read all the newspapers in Hong Kong, I'm not, I don't understand why you locals are so negative about Hong Kong. He said, from us, coming from Europe, I mean, Hong Kong is excellent. You have plenty of opportunities because of China uh, and the rest of the world. It's a very cosmopolitan place, very safe, excellent healthcare, good education overall. Uh, obviously, the rental is expensive, but on the other hand, Europe is not cheap either. Um, and tax is extremely low. So they said, you know, they are allow a lot of us Europeans moving to Hong Kong. So foreigners look at Hong Kong with kind of a very different eyes than our own people. Now, I will also say that the, the best of the prices in Hong Kong, they actually are also enjoying the fruits of our progress. And by the way, the best enterprises in Hong Kong are not afraid of competition. And it's only through competition that Hong Kong would prosper and thrive. But I think some of these so-called so localism, uh, which is a term that I don't quite understand, um, this sentiment comes from people that may not see that the progress in Hong Kong, economic growth and all, are providing them with enough opportunities. And I think we should think hard about how we should kind of provide opportunities for our people, not just for the kind of best enterprises. And I think that is an issue that we have to think about. But on the other hand, I would hope that Hong Kong people would not feel that because they are feeling that they are all competed, that we should close our door. Protectionism has no future, particularly for a place like Hong Kong. We should, as uh, we have said many times before, Hong Kong should be a place that can attract both talent and capital. And between the two, Talent is more important than capital, and we should be just developing talent, not just locally, but also attracting them from the rest of the world, retaining them there, uh, here, and developing them. Because all these overseas talents can create jobs for our local people as well. Well, yes, um, I agree no more. And I want to give you two examples, or uh, one example and one comment. Uh, talking about, uh, I want to use an, um, an example from an international school. Actually, one of the very famous international school, international school uh, newly established in Hong Kong, the principal told me that they do have schools in different places in Asia. They have a school in Thailand, they have schools in China, they have one site in Hong Kong. And the Hong Kong site, you can't believe it, is the easiest one to find all the faculty. When once they announced they established a school in Hong Kong, to find a teacher, the faculty used to be the biggest problem for a school to set up for your information. But for Hong Kong set up, they have no problem at all to recruit the whole suite of faculty. And I think Hong Kong do have its own attractiveness, and this is something that we need to preserve. And uh, as and also as a member, as a worker in the finance industry right now, and then I, I'm so glad that Fred Tab said I'm a pleasant. And then well, I do welcome the the establishment or the more company come to Hong Kong to establish the office. Talking about asset management, because of the taxation, the simple taxation system in Hong Kong, and then also because of the growth of wealth in China, Hong Kong has a natural competitive edge to become the asset management center in the whole Asia. And then if the company is not coming into Hong Kong, how can we have the critical mass? And then what we are seeing as a practitioner in the industry is that we want the pie growing we are not seeing the competitiveness. We are not seeing the other people taking our job. But what we see is that they come here to create more jobs for us. And also, if they are so well established in the other part of the world, why don't we let them in and then we learn? And this is our future. Well, talking about the future, I think it's time uh, for me to invite the future to ask the three speakers' questions. So any future bankers who would like to ask questions, Yes, uh, student in green. I assume you're a student. Currently, you're year three students studying in Hong Kong U. Um, I would like to ask about technology. Um, I saw in the report of, uh, from uh, Mr. Joe Nine that uh, insurance front office has been uh, an area with huge demand. I wonder, uh, would there be any chance in the next 10 to 15 years, let's say, there is like Alibaba set up an efficient insurance uh, 
electronic platform selling some standardized insurance products, it will hugely affect the demands of insurance, or to a broad extent to the whole, uh, to all speakers, um, which area in banking do you think will be much harder to be replaced by technology um, in the next 10 to 15 years in financial service? Thank you. Joe? No, no that's, that's a great point. You know, um, as McKinsey, one of the things that we have been <laughs> working with our clients these days, every single day, there's people asking us, okay, internet finance, what's the future, what are we doing, and all that. As you can imagine, every day I'm in China, that's a question that they ask me every single day. Look, I think that the, I think that the technology has, you know, has will impact the financial industry in a very big way, right? I do think that you're seeing a lot of that right now uh, in China. I think you're seeing that a lot of that right now in many countries. I think it all, it, it starts with payments, obviously, right? So if you look at payments today, a lot of payments um, traditionally are through credit cards, but today there's actually a lot more proliferation, right, around payments, around how you actually get paid, uh, whether it's person to person, and whether it's actually through some other um, payment system. I think that it will also affect what we call the distribution, right? So today, um, the way how you would want to buy a financial product, right? Um, would you want to have a person in there, or are you what we call the you know people who um, are very good in self-selecting, right, or, or, or self-directing, right, your your business, whether it's online banking, whether it's through online insurance or others. So I do think that technology will have a very big role in disintermediating a lot of people. However, I do think that you know it creates a few more dynamics that's very important to understand. The first thing is that. What technology will replace? We replace all the very simple things. Okay? So if you have no more value, and I think that we've seen that in stock brokerage, okay? People who used to be able to answer the phone and to put in an order for you to buy some stocks, right? You actually have no role in the future, right? Because if all you're doing is taking an order of stock and placing it down, right? People will do it through electronically, right? People do it through the phone. People have different ways to actually do it, and that is already gone, okay? Now it will continue. Up the value chain, right? If you are just talking about a very simple financial product, right? Like travel insurance, right? Why do I need someone to tell me travel insurance? I can just buy, look at the terms, I'll buy auto insurance, right? If I have a car, I just need to understand what's the legal requirements and buy it, I can do it, right? So as you go up more and more, the simple products, the simple things, you know, and it's not only in, in financial services, right? Maybe in teaching, you have it too, right? So the simple things that you can learn online by yourself, self-directed, will all get replaced by technology. However, if you talk to any real banker, they will tell you that, you know what? The relationship I have with my client and what I'm telling them, I know the name of their dog. I know the birthday of their son. I know what he wants to do of their future plans in education. And so therefore, I'm able to have the conversation around some protection elements, around how to protect yourself if something happens to your family so that my kid can still go to school. That would never get replaced by technology, or at least not yet, not in the next 10 years, right? So the question is gonna be not te whether technology will replace or will disintermediate a lot of people in the financial industry. It's a question is technology is raising the bar on what it is for all of us in the financial industry to survive, right, and to make a living. Because all the simple things, all the automated things that can be automated will get automated, right? So I'm a firm believer that technology will change all the things dramatically. I'm a firm believer that technology may replace more jobs than it creates, maybe in some ways. But I'm also a firm believer that if you have value, right, and you can have a real conversation, and you have a real relationship, right, I think that the banker who is there servicing a financial need will be around for the next 100 years, and that can never be replaced by any computer Right, or any iPhone, or any WhatsApp, right? So I think that that's gonna be where I think the bar for all of us is. And unfortunately, that bar has risen, right? In Anthony's and Fred's day, that bar could be, I can write English, right? Today, right, that bar has risen dramatically, right? And the question for all of us, and if you look towards the future, yes, technology is a great enabler, but it also has risen the standard of what the industry and all the consumers require out of us as individuals. And so therefore, we, if we want to be a financial center of the future, of globally, we can up our game. Our game gotta be high. We are not playing the local league. We're playing Champions League, right? So we gotta play in that league, where the Hong Kong local league is no longer enough. And that is the problem, the technology the challenge, the technology is giving us, right? So I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in it, but I think that it brings a lot of opportunity as well. For the uh, young people here, you may be interested to know that when Anthony and I joined banking back in 1973, there's no mobile phone, there's no email, 
We communicate with New York through telex. And we have to use the fixed line to make a phone call to New York. So technology has changed the world indeed. You have any comment to make? Well, but we are still here. <laughs> <laughs> and in the future world, or should I say in the present world, I mean, you better be a master of technology rather than slaves of, te or slaves of technology. If you're the master, you have a great future. If you're a slave, then God bless you. Yeah. Okay, my turn. And then as, um, also, as a petitioner in, in the banking industry right now, what I will respond to your question is that actually the banks embrace the change. We take the technology and then we really um, move along with the change and also with the development of technology. And then one example is that we used to have the very traditional uh, banking operations. We, uh, everybody deal with the banking transaction in the branches. And of course, several years ago, everybody moved online. And then now, online banking take a very chunky share of uh, overall banking transactions. And then right now, what the banks are doing is that we move forward. We actually move along with the development of technology because the next phase, what we see will be the boom of mobile banking. So actually all the people working in the banking industry is not afraid of the change or afraid of the technology or being replaced by technology because we actually we move on and then now we are moving to the next stage and then all the products we need to integrate with uh, daily lives because banking is just something that you need to deal with on day-to-day -day basis and so uh, integration with technology we move along with technology is our future. If I may also uh, kind of comment on a slightly different direction. You are challenged not just by technology, you are challenged by competition from outside too, particularly by the so-called mainland uh, students. And I believe that is uh, one of the sentiments that Joe commented on, that I mean, uh, a lot of banks, a lot of private equity firms, uh, uh, and also investment banks are hiring students from the mainland. And I would say, yeah, you know, that, that, that is happening. Uh, and the reason is very simple, because China, whether you will like it or not, is now the second largest economy in the world, will be the uh, largest economy in actually uh, no time. And for all financial institutions, including foreign ones, China is probably the number one potential market. So we want employees to have a very good understanding of China, not just their language ability, but also really deep understanding of how China works. They understand the geography, they understand the history, they understand the culture, they understand the politics, so on and so forth. Um, and obviously, for those people that are from China, maybe they have a certain network too. But it doesn't mean that we only hire people from China because where Hong Kong thrives and Hong, and, and Hong Kong can actually compete is that our people should both understand China, because we are Chinese, as well as understand the rest of the world. So, yeah, it is a tall order. We have to understand both. But on the other hand, this is where Hong Kong would excel, and this is why Hong Kong is still the international financial center in East Asia. So when I read news about I mean, uh, students saying that, look, I mean, uh, if you force me to go to China, I'm going to protest and that kind of thing, I was asking, why? Why? I mean, uh, I think that whoever proposes it is really well-meaning. They really want our students to understand the largest market in the world. And if you don't understand, you are really giving up one of your major advantages. So, so I actually don't understand why people would resist. Um, now, clearly, just understanding China is not enough. You have to understand the rest of the world, too. And you have to make sure that we use the institutional advantages of Hong Kong which is the rule of law, uh, freedom, so on and so forth. But understanding China is very important for you from your career point of view. Another question. Uh, I'll give a chance to a lady. The lady in green. Yes. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask a question to Anthony because I am uh, an econ student and now I try to find a job. But one question always consume, uh, confused me that uh, when I try to find a job, should we just uh, select a sector in the finance, financial service industry or just maybe look around for all the positions we can? Because, um, but someone told me that we should uh, stick to a sector because if you 
find a job, you go go to a sector and um, and then your experience will be accumulated. If you switch another sector, and then your experience will be discounted. But as in terms of your experience, I find you seem to involve in all the sector of financial industry. But but uh, as for your success, so you are so that successful that uh, it couldn't be said that your experience is discounted. So what's your comments about this? Yeah. Well, obviously people would have different views on this one. If you just want to be what I call a transactor, then you probably should focus on one area. But transactors are probably uh, not the most senior level jobs in almost any organization. I would say this, because you, would, you have to expect that you will live to 120. So you have a very long life in front of you. The world is going to change so much that whether you like it or not, there will be a lot of changes to your career and maybe to your family. So one, be prepared for change. And secondly, in today's world, unlike in the industrial world, where in the industrial world, we encourage people to specialize so that you, know, you would do certain things well and do repeatedly so you will either have economy of scale or the learning curve effect, so you lower the cost. But nowadays, we already have entered the knowledge economy, or some would even say it's a creative economy. And in the knowledge economy, it requires that you have a broad base of knowledge and you somehow can kind of somehow find synergy in all. And not just that you not only have the functions, you have to do it, you have to add the design and also be able to tell a good story. So it requires multiple skills. And hence, in the last education reform, we advocate that people should have a broader knowledge base. And hence, I mean, uh, we somehow uh, and we recommended that universities be four years instead of three years. I'm not going to struggle on education too much uh, in this forum. But on the other hand, what I'm saying is you should have a broad base of knowledge as well as experience. Especially when you become more senior or when we are looking for senior managers. We want people not just with one specialty, but the ability to actually synthesize a lot of things. And the broader experience you have, chances are you, you'll be able to make decisions better and with a fresh angle that differentiates you from a competitor. To a certain extent, if you look at my career, it's not just in multiple areas in financial services. I also have done a lot of what I call extra activities. I have always had all kinds of other things. Like I formed two alumni associations. Um, I have engaged in public service since, uh, since I was uh, 35. Um, so this multiple experience enables me to have a perspective that my other colleagues may not have. And hence, I was fortunate enough to be a senior manager, actually a regional manager at, at the age of 30. One thing that, uh, that, as I said, since you have a very long life, you have to expect change. There is a research or there was a report that predicts that in your life, you, you, are, you would have on average, 11 jobs and change professions four times. So to just specialize in one doesn't really fit the world of the future. Yep, thank you so much. Okay, uh, I'm, anybody from, uh, how about the students? Uh, yes, the, in uh, classes. Um, good afternoon, I'm Brian, a year two student from Faculty of Business and Economics. I would like to pose two questions our honorable speakers. First, what is the outlook on the future of Hong Kong's financial industry? Second, what is the Hong Kong's advantage when it compares with other Asian financial centers like Singapore or Shanghai? Thank you. Um, my point of view, uh, I would say, of course, some people, I do heard about some comments that um, is the financial industry become a sunsetting industry. Of course, I do not agree. I think on the other the other way around, I think it's a booming industry. Because well, why I say so? Because, well, uh, I think um, when we analyze from the perspective of Hong Kong, 
and how Hong Kong played the role uh, among the world or in particular in Asia. And then, well, simply, I can I can point out four four trends that which is a growing trend for the banking industry or for, for the financial industry in Hong Kong. First of all, as we talk about uh, technology, and then we just mentioned that, that after online banking, and then the next phase will be the mobile banking, which create a, a number of jobs, and not just in economics or business, but also in IT. IT is a hot job when we need to develop some technology, when we want to integrate the banking or the other financial services into this um, mobile um, device. And then the second, and then as I mentioned, the asset management center, and then Hong Kong do have an edge because of the taxations, because of our proximity to China. And then, you know, mainland is actually a fastest growing economy in the world. Its size and also the, the pace of the growth is something that we cannot ignore. And then for the people working in Hong Kong, no matter you work in wealth management or corporate banking or retail banking, you deal with, um, you deal with the flows or the business with um, link to China day to day. And then with that, and then it is a, it gives us a natural, competitive edge to be the, the asset management center in Asia. And apart from that, and then also after financial tsunami, and then as we mentioned, and then one of our job is compliance, and then the risk control is also linked to the financial industry. And then simply, I can cite um, many examples that there are many trends and then happening, or many things happening within the financial industry which help to create or the growth of the industry and also create more jobs. And so what I say, uh, what I think is that the financial industry actually is booming, but just in different forms and also in different in different um, jobs and then created. Do you, do you want to comment about Shanghai or Singapore? Oh. <coughs> All of them have a thriving financial services sector. But as I said, Hong Kong should not be afraid of competition. China is, well, Asia is a huge market. And so just like uh, other continents, you can have multiple financial centers. What I think uh, we should compete on would be one compete on our strengths, and that is we already have a thriving and a very large financial sector. Um, in financial markets, it is somewhat like the um, the markets for talent, and that is the more liquidity you have, uh, you attract even more liquidity. Meaning, the more money you have, you attract more money. Likewise, in any the talent hubs, the more talents you have, the more successful you will be in attracting talents to Hong Kong or to that place. And so, so I, I keep on coming back to Hong Kong should try every means to be a talent hub as well as a financial center. So, joy, 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 both talents as well as uh, Kind of money, but uh, but Singapore has its strengths too. Uh, I think it serves mainly the, the ASEAN markets. Uh, they want to serve China, but it's a bit farther away from China. Shanghai is obviously a great market, but on the other hand, uh, is very much still a domestic market. For financiers, uh, for international uh, investors, we still like uh, English law or common law the most and Hong Kong practices come along. And hence, one of the things that we must ensure that Hong Kong would keep is our rule of law. Recent events in Hong Kong may have kind of sent people the perception that the uh, rule of law is not as good as before, but I hope that we can somehow restore our uh, image that Hong Kong is still very much using uh, kind of common law and the rule of law still reigns in Hong Kong. I will entertain one more question before we wrap up the session. The lady in red with the number 12 on your jacket. Thank you. Um, it's from Lady Halton Harley from 12th floor. So um, just adding on to the positioning of Hong Kong as a financial center, um, you mentioned that Hong Kong has a very competitive tax taxation structure. I'm just wondering, what do you see uh, in terms of like a global picture? such as from Ireland. Ar Ireland has a 12% corporate tax, whereas Hong Kong has 16%. And that there is a thriving industry in aviation finance uh, currently, and one of the Irish university, UCD, has already set up aviation finance in master degree. So to adding on the asset management institution specialization you mentioned on earlier, so the industry be is becoming more and more professionalized. Do you have any plans in, in proposal to to welcome this opportunity in terms of um, um, 
education or tax reform. Or and, and my second question actually echoes with the the other guy uh, early on. It's about uh, positioning with Shanghai and Singapore as an entry of China because uh, both of you mentioned earlier on that the English profici proficiency in Shanghai institutions is not is not worse in Hong Kong and that uh, the mainland students send an edge in terms of cultural understanding of the Chinese. So do you think Hong Kong will stand at a disadvantage in terms of that? So these are my two questions. Well, if I may uh, direct the first question to Fred Ma, who used to be the Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury, and the second question to Joe Ai, who, who kind of some advises clients uh, a lot on this issue. Actually, Anthony, I think you have forgotten the fact that you were the Financial Secretary who raised the corporate tax rate. <laughs> Well, I think tax is a, um, a very interesting issue. We pride ourselves to be a regime that has a low tax rate as well as a simple tax regime. But at that point of time, if you compare our tax rate with that of Singapore or Ireland, as you said, I mean, uh, the, the gap then was bigger. Now the gap is actually quite narrow. And we should really think about uh, whether we should make changes to our tax regime so that we can attract the activities that relate to Hong Kong as well as broaden the tax base but that is actually for a different uh, kind of time of discussion. Um, but I think we should think about what would attract activities to Hong Kong. And by the way, I think while tax is important, uh, that may not be the most important. Because if you can make money, companies will not mind paying corporate tax. And our tax is actually quite competitive. But if you somehow can clarify on certain points, like, you know, I think just, it's only just recently, that we clarify that offshore income of, say, private equity activities will not be taxed. Uh, that, I think, would provide uh, a lot of attractions as well, because for tax, it's not just the rate, it's the simplicity as well as the clarity. Uh, but I think that we would, I know, should I say, I think we should all discuss and make proposals to the government so that they can really make Hong Kong a place that can attract more economic activities, of, obviously of the right kind, and uh, more talents to Hong Kong. Joe, would you mind uh, taking on the Shanghai Singapore question? Well, I think that you know one of the things that everyone's very concerned about, right, is the Hong Kong competitive positioning for other financial centers around the world. I I'll just say one thing, right? It is our game to lose. Okay, I think right now, if you ask anyone in Shanghai, anyone in Singapore, I tell you deep down in their heart, they want to be us. Okay, the question is whether we want our future to be brighter than theirs is completely in our hands. Because right now, if you think about teens data, young boy, we have actually everything on our side, okay? They don't have the market, right? We have the rule of law, we have the tax, we have the regime, we have the people, we have all that. The only question is gonna be, you know, in 10 years time, right? Are you gonna be making the money or is someone else gonna make money? For the next 10 years, we'll be fine, right? And that's a question in my mind for Hong Kong, right? Is if we take a preservation mindset, that we preserve everything here, right, and milk it. We can do it for the next 10 years. Right? The question is for the future, right? Will you be able to, 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 to have that? And you know, it's our game to lose, right? So in all areas, right, whether it's asset management, whether it's wealth management, whether it's investment banking, whether it's corporate banking, I mean, in every single place, I, mean, I would only see that um, if we get our act together, and that's the government, right, um, the stakeholders, uh, you know, Lashko and everyone together. If, if we are all in one mindset, right, we can make it happen. Unfortunately, in Hong Kong today, that's easier said than done. And that's really sort of our battle, right, with everything else going on here. But just remember one thing, right? If 20 years from now, and you here see the Hong Kong Financial Center place, right, is actually lower than Shanghai, lower than Singapore, remember that we lost it, right? It is our game. Um, I want to wrap up this uh, forum by asking uh, Wendy and Anthony, both are uh, you know, professionals in the financial services industry, one question, and that is, many of our young people today worry about their upward mobility. From your perspective, do you see another Wendy Yun from the group here, another Anthony Lam from the group here in, say, 15, 20 years time? Well, I see a lot of Wendy's, or even better, Wendy's out there. But may not be Anthony, because he's already a Dai Lo, or we always say that. 
Well, in terms of upward mobility, I don't, I don't see any problem at all. Actually, what I, what in my perspective is that the financial industry in Hong Kong has the breadth and also the depth. Actually, all along the career ladder are so steep, so steep. And then we are not just talking about one job or one specific job or in one particular sector. Actually, there are so many sectors. No matter you're talking about banking, no matter you're talking about insurance, no matter you're talking about asset management, all have very steep career path or ladder. And why I say so? Because actually, the financial market in Hong Kong is so attractive. And then, well, we do have our present competitive edge. And then we do attract a lot of people. Still, a lot of outside companies are, are, are moving their offices in Hong Kong, establish the business here. And so to answer the question is that we, everybody in the financial industry, or for those who are interested to join the financial industry, is that we should have the confidence. And then we should embrace the change. And then we should welcome the competition. We should attract them to come to Hong Kong because if we cannot grow the market here, how can we have how can we create even more senior positions? And then the upward mobility also linked to the development of the industry. When the industry is booming, when we have the market in our future, I don't see a problem at all. Yeah, I don't really want uh, people out in the audience and also in the community to become an anti entity because he is a failure. But um, yeah, I mean, I um, got kicked out of the financial sector and now they have to work in a property firm. But <laughs> no, you you but quit, not kick out. But joke, but jokes aside, I mean... You um, kicked the industry out. <laughs> but jokes aside, uh, I actually think that uh, there is plenty of opportunity for Hong Kong people to enter the industry and to thrive and to move upwards. However, People would have to be prepared that you have to work very hard uh, and also be very mobile. I saw some surveys that uh, among our students, uh, most people would not like to work outside Hong Kong. And that to me is alarming because financial services among all industry is probably the most global because money here can be a a dollar here can be a dollar in the United States in 0 0.01 second. So, so financial services is truly a very global industry, if not the most global industry. And hence, for financial services firms to look for future leaders, they want their leaders to have the global perspective. And to be have and to have global perspective doesn't mean that you would log on to your internet or your emails or your Facebooks every day. You have to work elsewhere. And again, I will come back to the point about working in the mainland of China. I mean, that is the number one market in the world. So be prepared to work there. Spend some time to understand the market. And if needed, go work in other markets. Because it's only through working in other markets that you really understand the industry. And also be prepared to work in the front office as well as the middle office as well as the back office. For large corporations, when they develop leaders, they would actually prepare a career plan so that you would move from front to back to middle, from one country to another, in different departments, before they would actually promote you to be a leader of the firm. So hence the question about whether you should stay in one discipline or in multiple disciplines. You should wish that you can work in multiple disciplines, because it's only through that you become a leader of any financial institution. And by the way, I mean, a financial institution is not the only thing in life. You should be prepared to actually somehow go out and create your own firm or actually do something very different. But as I said, and I say it again, a career in financial services would prepare you for many things. It's not just in numbers. It really is in your financial acumen and also in the risk management, in compliance, and also give you a perspective that may actually propel you to a even more interesting career. And I can't say what the career will be because if we look back, say, not say 40 years ago, even 20 years ago, how can anybody predict that, I mean, uh, the two miles in Hong Kong would be as wealthy as our richest, richest person in Hong Kong? I can't tell you in 20 years time what that industry will be. Because there will be industries that will come up that we will not know today. You won't, you won't know it, I won't know it. So, so having a broad career 
and a career in financial services that actually would have kind of multiple disciplines would prepare you well for that. Well, on that encouraging note, thank you very much speakers, Joe, Anthony and Wendy for joining us today. And I'm sure the audience really enjoy your work. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insight. And please remain on stage. We now invite Dean Chang to present souvenirs to our honorable guests today as a token of gratitude. Ms. Wendy Yun, please. Thank you. Mr. Joe Ai, please. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Fred Ma, please. Thank you. And Mr. Anthony Lerm, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. May I now invite the Dean and four honorable guests to take a group photo, please. Thank you. The talk has come to an end. Thank you for joining us and hope to see you in our future events. Thank you.